Jesus leads us into freedom. Sometime in the 1980s, um, the, the term glass ceiling entered the American vocabulary. The idea behind it was both with the issue of race as well as with gender, that even as great strides have been made in American culture of bringing greater freedom, whether on the basis of, of race or gender, there were still some invisible barriers keeping people down. Before there was a glass ceiling, there was actually a wall. There, there were literally barriers in society that were seen and reinforced. But Jesus Christ tore down that wall. We have sometimes built it up in different ways, but Jesus himself is the one who comes in and leads us into true freedom. And part of that freedom, and this is what we're going to focus on today, is, is the freedom of what it means to be the body of Christ, male and female together. I think, one, I think an argument can be made that if you look at the life of Jesus and, and you want to be convinced that he is coming from heaven down to earth, one of the ways that you could come, become convinced is just by looking at how Jesus interacted with women. He was, in this sense, truly a man out of his time. He, he didn't, the way that he taught us, the way that he showed us, the way that men and women are supposed to relate with one another. Nothing in his culture, the way that they were practicing God's word, is preparing you for what you see in Jesus. If you didn't know this, in Jesus' day, uh, faithful Jews were taught 18 benedictions that they were supposed to pray every day. Uh, this, this shapes you, it enculturates you, it, it, it tells you what to be thankful for, what is good, what is a blessing. One of those prayers is, thank God I'm not a woman. That's the culture. Then Jesus comes in, and Jesus just starts knocking down the walls of, of, of those fallen ways of being together. Jesus, in John chapter 4, he, he, he does two things at the same time. He approaches a Samaritan woman. He sits at a well, and she's there, and he asks her for a drink. And he treats her like a person. And, and she is both Samaritan and woman. And, and Jewish men didn't do these sorts of things. But Jesus did these sorts of things. One of the more famous passages of Jesus interacting with two women is the story of Mary and Martha. And I've heard this story used in, in a sermon once talking about introverts versus extroverts. That's not what this story is about. Maybe that's at play in some way here, but that's not what this story is about. Jesus the rabbi is in the front room and he is teaching. Mary is sitting at his feet. And in that day, those words, what it clues you into is, is that she's taking the position of a disciple and she's sitting as his at his feet as one of the disciples. Martha is in the back room and she's preparing for the meal and she's doing the traditional role that women are supposed to be doing and she's getting frustrated that Mary's out there and she's back there and who is she taking this position? And do you remember what Jesus said? Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing. Jesus accepted her as a disciple and affirmed that it is more important for her to be a disciple of his than fulfilling any of the traditional gender roles of their day. It is no accident that the first witness to the resurrection were women. I wonder if it isn't in some way because Jesus is honoring them because they were the ones who stood by him at the cross. The men all fled. And, and not only were they the first witnesses, but Jesus charged them with authority to go and to tell the, the apostles that he is risen. Jesus broke down the walls. Today we are asking ourselves the question, how as the church are we to live into the redemptive model of male-female relationships today? 
Uh, Jesus is showing us the way, but in our society and in our church, there is still more work to be done. How is he calling us to live into this? I want to begin by, by showing you the dream. I, I, looking at this dream of the redemptive community, the blessed family of God, I, we're going to look at a creation text, Genesis, and we're going to look at a salvation text from Galatians. And, and, it, and it's giving us a picture, both of them, of what God intends as far as men and women together. First passage is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Foundational text. This is answering the question, who is God? Who are we? Who are we in relationship to God? And what are our functions in the world? This is God's word. Let's hear it. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Let me just point out a couple of things from this passage. There is nothing in this passage that, that establishes a hierarchy of men over women or women over men. God creates humankind and, and together, male and female, we express the image of God. Implication of this being men by ourselves, we will not express the image of God as well as men and women together. Women by ourselves, we will not express the image of God as women and men. It, we need one another for the fullness of, of what this is. And, and one of the first implications, go be fruitful and fill the earth with other human beings. We need each other for that. We, this is just, there is a picture here of standing alongside one another and together having dominion, rule, using power and authority. We have two creation accounts. We have the initial picture in Genesis 1, and then we move to a more intimate picture in Genesis 2. And I, let me put forward to you again, in this, in this second image, it begins with a man alone, and, and, and he's participating with God in creation. God gives him the task to name all of the animals, and, and this is part of the mandate that's been given to us, that we're to be co-creators with God. He is the creator, but he gives us a part to play of stewarding, of bringing order out of chaos. And, and in the naming part, it has implication that it takes wisdom. And, and Adam is probably going to grow. He definitely learns something in this process of naming. And, and, but he's, he's participating in creation. You, you've got to have the wisdom to see the character of the thing, give it a name appropriate. Adam goes through, he names all of these animals, but he learns something. Out of all of these animals that have been created, something is still missing in him. He is alone. And for the first time, in all of the creation account, we hear it is not good. And then we hear God look at this and evaluate it and say it is not good. And therefore, he is going to create out of the man's side a woman. And she is going to be, uh, the NIV, I think, does a good job with this, a suitable helper. But let's be clear, on, again, there is nothing here that's establishing a hierarchy where the man is above the woman or the woman is above the man. And the, and the typical way that sometimes this gets read is, is that, well, it's a helper, so she needs to come and serve him. No, that's not the implication of this word. This word typically, in almost every instance, gets used with reference to God's relationship with Israel. And God is not subservient to us human beings. Um, if anything, it's reversed. But it's not trying to establish hierarchy. It, it's saying that God wants to provide somebody who is, and this is the other word, suitable, perfectly equipped to come alongside and to fill that which is lacking. Here's our picture of creation. 
man and woman together, and only together can we express the fullness of the image of God. Nothing about hierarchy of one over the other, but together being charged as image bearers. Now let me read for you from Galatians. Galatians, Paul is writing a letter, he's writing to Christians who are struggling with what it means to be free in Jesus Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Paul will say these words to them. Okay, so let's, let's figure out how to use this freedom. And, and one part is, is that they're, they're tempted back to go into old ways and, 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 and old guardians that it doesn't bring us into the fullness of Christ. And so in Galatians 3, 23 through 28, Paul speaking into this situation, trying to help them understand where we are headed, what, what God's plan is for us. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, that is, faith in Jesus Christ who sets us free, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. You have a new status. You're part of the family of God. And in this family, the old order of things, which is marked by the fall, the old divisions of things, hear these words. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, there, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Whether because of race or because of class or because of gender, the old hierarchies of things that divided us up and stratified us and gave us different positions of status, all of that's being done away with and we're living into a new reality of us standing together as one family, brothers and sisters, whatever race that we may be, whatever class that we may be, this is where we're headed. This is our freedom. At Westside, we are seeking to live into that redemptive model. And, and I, I put this in your notes, and I, and I spent some time just carefully actually writing these words, and they're in your notes, and I want you to hear them, because it's telling you, we believe we're headed in this direction, and this is what we're trying to do. Here's how we are going to function together. Authority. Authority is demonstrated in submission to Christ. You and I, we are called to submit to one another and as Christ is our Lord and, and to call one another to put Jesus first in our life. Authority is going to be demonstrated in our submitting to Christ and saying, it's not really what I want and it's not really what you want. It's about what Jesus wants. Let's follow him. Power. Power is supposed to be harnessed in serving love. Uh, power is not going to be used to suppress. Power is not going to be used in coercion. We've been shown a different way of power. Our power that we've been given is supposed to be used in serving love to one another. Position is determined by the gifts and call of the Holy Spirit. There is no position in the church, whether pastor, elder, deacon, or any other ministry area that is limited by the issue of gender. It's going to be on the basis of gifting, and it's going to be on the basis of call, and we believe that God can call both men and women into any of those areas of service and leadership. Not all churches do it this way. Probably most Bible-believing churches actually don't do it this way. We do it this way because we believe it's the best reading of the Bible. Now, we affirm men and women uniquely represent the image of God. Men and women are different. Thank the Lord. I, I, I like the differences. Now, I was talking to somebody this week, 
And, and one of the things that comes here that I feel like when, when we talk about the fact that we are different, each of us uniquely repre represents the image of God. Uh, there's, you know, this is where we, the fullness of the image gets, gets shown through our relationships together. But I had somebody talking to me this week and, and goes, yeah, but it feels like a little bit because, well, we're taught to say God is our father, that God is really more male than female. No. No, that's not what we believe. I know it, it, can, it can come across that way, but each of us expresses the image of God. When we understand God, he is spirit, he doesn't have a body, he is neither male nor female, we get revealed the divine name of God as father, and it's to show us that he is our parent. He has the fullness of all of the qualities of motherhood and fatherhood in perfection. But let's not confuse things by thinking about God with gender. So we have a name, it's father, it makes us think about a man, but God is not a man. Don't confuse that one. We affirm that the differences between men and women are of more of degree than kind. And what I mean by this is that there may be something where we sit there and we, and we think about some godly characteristics, and some of those godly characteristics may, may be something where we more naturally associate it with men. And, I'll, and, and what I wanted to do here is I wanted to, to use very positive characteristics. At first I was going to say assertiveness, and then I went, oh, that could be a little bit negative. So I'm just going to use the word strength, and I'm not saying that women aren't strong. You're going to hear me clarify that point. But I, I go, when you think about strength, you probably, men, strong, okay, got it. There may be godly characteristics that appear more feminine, like I would put forward empathy. But we believe every human being is called to be conformed to the full image of God. Empathy, strength, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, mercy, patience, gentleness, humility, love. All of us are called to grow up and have these fruit of the Spirit, these characteristics of God-likeness be reflected in our nature. I believe that, that every one of us have unique strengths. And, and we're supposed to rub off on each other and help build one another up. And, and you know, and... and one of my natural strengths, according to strength finders at least, is self-assurance. Now, I will tell you as a Christian, it sounds a little bit like pride. And, it, you know, and as a pastor, it's not one that I really like to boast about too much. I am pretty confident. I don't really doubt. But I can bring something to a team of people where it's like, we're going to get this thing done. We don't have to. Oh, hey, we got it. Let's go. Let's do it. Um, I think I'm supposed to help rub that off on people. Now, the assurance is in God and what he can do through us and stuff like that. I think that the, some of the natural strengths of men and women were supposed to rub off on each other. I shared this in the earlier service and they laughed about it, so I think I'm safe to do it in this service. But one of my favorite examples here is, is Steve Shalata. Steve Shalata said, you know, when I got married, my emotional spectrum was like the Red Robin three-pack of colors. It was very, very limited to about three different emotions. My wife, on the other hand, she had like the 96 pack of Crayola crayons with the little sharpener. And, and, and she asked me this question, what do you feel like doing? What kind of question is that? I have no idea what I'm feeling like doing. What am I, oh no, what's happening? And um, he says over the years, his three pack has kind of expanded into a 12 pack. His wife has rubbed off on him. Still doesn't have the night, maybe the 24 pack, but probably the 12 pack, that's what he says. And, and, and I think these differences were intended. They're different in degree, not in kind. All of these godly characteristics were all called, but, but we're gonna help each other grow up into this. As I said, there are churches who approach this much differently. They don't allow for women to be in roles of leadership. They have very strict gender roles, specific things that you need to do. I want to tell you three things about why we do what we do. I believe that the Bible is very pro-women. And, and, and Old Testament, New Testament, whole thing, I think it shines out in the New Testament. It's there in the Old Testament. Part of the challenge for us is cultural. We, we, we aren't from that culture. We don't see, especially in the Old Testament, God coming and being gracious to a broken society 
meeting them where they are, and slowly drawing them towards the biblical ideal. He establishes it in the creation account, but so much in the Bible is being put forward of lifting up, elevating women, protecting them from the ways that men have dominated and abused. I believe the Bible is pro-women. I believe the Bible is pro-men. I believe that it wants to liberate us into being who God has intended us to be. And, and one of the ways that it is pro-men is by helping call us to our best selves in Christ and, and, and to be transformed where our approaches of power, where we tend to dominate and we tend to abuse women are undone. It's, it's something that is still present in our society, right? Me Too movement, toxic masculinity. There are things where the way that men treat women, there's transformation that is needed. L let me give you an example of, of the way, one of the ways of being pro-men where it's trying to call us to our best selves, and it's from Matthew chapter 5. Men, don't look at women lustfully. If you do, you're committing adultery in your heart. So, pornography use in America is something like more than 50% of men on a weekly basis are, are, are using pornography. Statistics would tell you that the difference between what's happening inside the church and what's happening outside the church doesn't seem to be any different. What does, what does training yourself to look at a woman lustfully do to you? It trains you to look at somebody who's been created in the image of God who, who is supposed to be a sister in Christ, you reduce them down to an object of self-gratification and you, and, you and, and, and you just objectify. You don't treat them as people. Jesus is calling us and saying, listen, it's going to be different among you. This isn't going to be the way for you. You're not going to live that way. You're not going to train yourself to look at women that way. I want you to see women as those who bear the image of God. And if it's your wife, to have, your, have all of your sexual passion and amorous love just dedicated to her in holiness, and if it's anybody else, then you see them as somebody who is special, unique, not somebody to be used, but somebody to be served. So I think it's pro-women, I think it's pro-men, and I think our approach, this approach where we are not, where authority is gonna be about mutual submission in Christ, power is going to be harnessed in serving love, where positions are gonna be based upon the gifting of the Holy Spirit, I believe this approach is the best reading of the Bible. And I'm going to invite up Wayne Pelly. And um, Wayne is involved in a ministry of really helping people process through and see the full counsel of God on this issue of male and female relationships. And I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a little over a dozen years ago, I was involved in a church whose policy regarding men and women in ministry really revolved around what are typically called the restrictive verses. You probably know the ones. 1 Corinthians 14, women are to keep silent in the church. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And those two verses were at the center and uh, dictated the policy. And the ways in which that policy was being implemented and enforced made me increasingly uncomfortable. Because of my background, I had been a pastor before, I, had been in, I was a graduate of seminary, but still I realized I did not have the wherewithal, the background, the tools, biblically and historically to articulate another point of view, a better point of view, I thought. And so I began a process that actually lasted several years um, of researching this issue in scripture, and I started with something one of my former New Testament professors had published back around the time I was in seminary, which was back in the 70s. Um, what he did was, he didn't start with any 
particular scripture, like the restrictive passages, he took his Bible and he read through it from beginning to end. And every time he encountered a passage that addressed gender in general or women in particular, he wrote that on a four by six note card. And his background was, a, uh, was as a specialist on New Testament culture, so he took those tools of historical investigation and cultural investigation and researched to understand each of these passages in their original context. Then he started sorting them, looking for patterns. And what he found was a lot of these passages simply described women doing ministry and leadership type of activities in ways that were countercultural, without any explanation, without any defense, with, as though these were accepted and normal in the life of the early church. So he put those in one stack. And he looked at that and he saw this was, this was more than half of the cards. So what's with that, especially with so much attention spent to these, and in, in so many churches, to the, just those two verses? And so, he, so the next question was, okay, what would have encouraged women to do that and encouraged men to accept and welcome those activities by women? So he went through the texts again and found quite a few that were encouraging to women. Now, when we think of, the, of the, that first category, he called that descriptive. Ralph has already mentioned some of those. For example, Mary Magdalene is commissioned by Jesus to be a witness to the apostles. Um, another Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus in Jesus' traveling seminary, and in a culture of very rigid gender roles, she crosses that line, and Jesus defends her. Paul, in Romans 16, mentions Junia as an apostle. He mentions Phoebe as a deacon, who in fact, is, in the way he describes her, is clearly the one who carried Paul's epistle to the Romans from where Paul was to Rome, and in that role, she would have been expected by the church at Rome to be the interpreter, the explainer of what Paul had said. So the second category he called instructive. These texts are instructing the church the way in which the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul want things to be done. So you have examples like Acts 2.38, for example, that Ralph had mentioned just a bit ago. You have all the passages dealing with spiritual gifts. There's no indication there that there's any gender restriction in how the Holy Spirit distributes those gifts. You have um, just a, a, a wide variety of passages that express that value. So now you have all of these texts categorized into three categories. You have descriptive, you have the instructive, and you have the restrictive. So now you have to ask a historical question. What's the relationship between these three in the life of the early church, and especially going from the Gospels to the early church? Well, at this point, it becomes, you know, and how do each of those explain the other? So at this point, what is clear is that the term restrictive is the wrong term for those two verses in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. A much better term is corrective. So you have descriptive, the most common, instructive, verses that encourage women and encourage men to welcome and accept, and you have two verses left that restrict women, and these are corrective, and you can see evidence for that in each of those passages. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, Women are the third group asked to be silent in a, in a passage that is about disruptions going on in the worship service. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the word used for authority is unique. It is not the normal word used for authority, and it has implications of domineering. So clearly, what Paul is saying women are not to do is not something I've ever seen a woman in leadership at this church do. So clearly, that's correcting a situation. And then there's a a lot of other clues as well. And, um, and we, we put a, a slide up. Oh, yeah. So he, this, is, this is based upon Wayne's research. Um, 36 descriptive, instructive passages that really provide the foundation of saying, here's the freedom that we're, we're being led into. And then two corrective passages that are saying, okay, let's clarify exactly how you're using your freedom in these circumstances. Um, this is why we think it's the best reading 
of Scripture. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, Wayne, you have, you, you've been doing this ministry, you go to Africa, you mm-hmm. walk people through this process. What has been the personal impact on you um, from, from doing this? Okay, well, I have to back up real quick just to say that what I hadn't mentioned was as I was doing this research, building, building on this model, um, I got connected with a ministry that also utilized this particular professor's research and work, and um, that was involved in doing ministry in Africa, doing seminars that addressed the um, issues in traditional culture in Africa. And so I've been involved with them since about 2010. And in 2014, I was invited by a partner ministry to speak at a conference they were holding on gender education. So I decided to do a paper based on this model of research and understanding gender in the New Testament. So I, so in, this was 2014, I spent the first half of the year working through all of this and confirming this whole process in a much more personal way that really gave me a, a much stronger basis to, to address this personally. Um, now, the, Ralph had mentioned, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus confronts men on the issue of treating women as sexual objects. And in that same chapter, he addresses men on the issue of they're, they're opting out of the cycle of vengeance and retaliation that is so characteristic of relationships between men in honor-shame cultures. I mean, you see that all through the Gospels because the disciples are constantly arguing over who's the greatest. You see other issues with respect to uh, men measuring their, their sense of self-worth but through material wealth and a variety of other things. So, like we talk about toxic masculinity today, Jesus was way ahead of that, of us on that, because this is exactly what he's dealing with. And what this alone, this diagram doesn't show, is that that is really the key in traditional cultures, both in in Jesus' day and in our day, and really in our culture as well, is men need to grapple with what it means to be a man. Because Jesus is basically, when, when you take all these texts and put them together, Jesus is redefining what it means to be a man. And just one example of of the impact of this, and actually this is really the key in our seminars, is we go through that issue before we look at the passages on women. Because once men understand how Jesus is freeing them, because toxic masculinity is also toxic to the men, once they understand what Jesus is doing, then they're ready to see and accept how Jesus is raising women as well. But in one particular story, in, in one particular culture in Africa, the, the, the tradition was that when a man came home, his wife would kneel before him to show her subservience. And the, the story comes out from one of my colleagues that in the case of one particular couple who were graduates of our seminar, when the husband came home and the wife knelt before him, he knelt down and looked her face to face and he says, you know what? I cannot love you if I am up there and you are down here. Thank you, Wayne. So, our, the way that we're trying to live together is, is, is right in that direction. Our structure supports it. We believe it's the best reading of the Bible. Um, we're practicing it, but in our practice, we have room to grow. And um, Christiane is uh, preparing for pastoral ministry. She's under care of our presbytery. Uh, she's taking uh, classes. She has been a leader in our church, uh, predating me coming. And um, she has served in a number of different ways. And I've, I asked her to come and share a little bit about her experience as far as just really living into this practice and how we're doing, and even some of giving us a picture as a woman, of helping raise the awareness of us men, we have some blind spots, and, and we need some help seeing those blind spots. So in some ways, I'm not quite the right person to talk about experiencing pain or barriers to leadership within the church. 
There are as many perspectives as there are women in, this is just my experience. So I grew up in a highly educated family on the progressive West Coast. I am the oldest child of multiple generations of oldest or only children. My birth order, family structure, and heritage all give me a confident sense that I am right. <laughs> it's practically encoded in my DNA. I am not really sure how self-assurance didn't make my top five on that strength finder test. I didn't become a Christian until I was in high school. I grew in faith through multiple Christian communities, which all affirmed women as equal, receiving God's gifts for ministry and service. I honestly thought that was the dominant Christian understanding. Many women in this church can speak much more to experiencing pain of being told otherwise while growing up. In my master's class at Whitworth, many women broke down in tears, describing how damaging and painful it's been to them to hear while growing up that their sense of identity, their sense of call, their God-given strengths were all wrong. I experienced Westside, our Presbytery, and our eco-denomination nationally as genuinely trying to live into the biblical reality of equality. There are both women and men speakers and examples of leadership at all the conferences. At Westside, we usually have an equal number of women and men serving as elders and deacons. Currently, we even have a fellowship elder who is a man and a property elder who is a woman. We pay attention to that call not to gender. In the past, we had a woman as our worship leader. So why do I continue to find myself as either the only or one of two women in leadership outside of session? Why are there still so many more men pastors than women pastors, even within a denomination that affirms the biblical understanding that women are gifted and called by God for leadership? Sorry. I think the answers are quite complex, but to a great degree, they are cultural. Remember that due to my unique combination of heritage, family structure, and growing up within a progressive subculture, my inner form, DNA, encoded identity is I'm right. So when I have to wade into a male-dominated space and feel like my points aren't heard, I'm not wounded in my inner person. I might be annoyed or think, really? Why don't you see it? <laughs> Based on their experiences growing up, many women feel inner discrediting and wounding at not being heard. Others are so exasperated, they just don't want to put up with it. Who wants to show up for that? I fortunately just know that the guys are missing it. Because I trust both the intent and the heart of the guys I work with who don't get it, I know that any discrediting I might feel is not intended. If I say those guys are just being guys, every woman in this room knows just what I mean. But I bet the guys are a little mystified. What is it? I'm honestly still very much in the process of trying to identify it more concretely. On the surface, it can look like a group walking in single file to a destination, starting and ending meetings with the topic and zero depth of discussion on how one another is doing personally, not seeing the importance of including times to connect as people not just on topics embedded in the, into larger gatherings. Not following through on affirmed and accepted ideas or items I submitted to the agenda. Not noticing when others in the group are not coming, contributing, and, and then following up, why, that, why might that be? Not going out of the way to make sure multiple voices from multiple perspectives are heard. Connecting over sports, 
video games and activities as opposed to relationships, health concerns, family, and friendship groups. It can feel like being invited to play a game where the rules and structures of the game were all set up by men and their preferred way of doing things. Then, after several thousand men, years, men said, okay, just come along, jump in. To try and fit in, you have to know all the rules of their game and play in a manner and style they established. If I show up and introduce a new goal, rule, or structure, some men might be a little confused and not understand what I'm saying, think, huh, that's odd. Not saying anything, go back to their way of playing, all the while genuinely mean and say to me, keep playing. Some men might even say and mean, sure, great idea. But then since they've been playing their game their whole life, they revert to muscle memory of their preferred style. Some men do start to get it, and they lean into being a voice for changing how we play the game to be more inclusive of everyone. Why do I keep playing the game when at times I feel like I'm not being heard? Because I think as a church body trying to live into all of us growing together into more Christ-like, God-ordained image of unity and wholeness is actually all of our call, and, and it's the goal for all of us. I also genuinely enjoy the game. I sometimes think it can use a little tweaking. Okay, we as a body are missing out if we don't seek out to include the voices of the many women who do not feel safe, invited, or included. So, um a couple months, well, about a month ago, just over a month ago, Christian and then um, myself and, and, and three other guys went to Colorado Springs for our eco-national gathering. So Christian had one of those experiences of being the one woman representative with four guys, and so here it is, four to one. That happens a lot. We're, we're, we're having dinner together. We're talking about gender issues. And... Um, and and you see, I totally believe in the equality of men and women that each of us each uniquely represent the image of God, that we're of equal value, that I, I, I've been in this model now I, I, my, my entire life. I came to it out of biblical conviction. I've had the joy of working alongside women pastors, women elders, women deacons, all different levels of leadership. And, um, and yet I still have blind spots so that we can be in conversation about gender. And, and I forget to say, wait a second, Christian, what again is your perspective? And even, and, and, and not talk over you, which I guess I did. Is that, that, uh, that yeah, that's that what I did. That happens a lot, too. <laughs> a lot, oh, come on. <laughs> the, uh, that, see, Christian and I, she pushes back. And so this, there's this wonderful thing where, and that's where a little bit of the, now, see, I, we were talking about this yesterday, and it's like, and all the things that she was saying, like, she did this funny thing. She's like, you know, like, we start with the task, but, you know, like, we don't start with relationships. I know all of the names of my friend's siblings. I didn't say anything at the time. I'm like, what? Who does that? I have, I have, I, I have no idea what any of the names of anybody on our staff siblings, I mean, I just don't think that way. And then it's just like, oh, look at that different. We got to wake up to these things together. We need this. And, you know, and, and that's really the call. It, and, you know, and, and part of this is, is that, you know, men, we come into a room and, and, and we may be functioning with this sense of belief of, of equality. We're excited that we're serving in teams with men and women together. But we may not be sensitive to the pain or the experience, the history we, we may, we, we take up more space. Our voices are louder. There is, our culture still has a tendency to put more weight in what men say. If we're going to live in this, men, we have to be intentional about drawing out, valuing, affirming. And, um, and, and, and then we need women to, to risk still giving us a chance <laughs> to not get it for a while, but we're committed to moving in this direction. Do we have time for the breakfast story? 
What's the breakfast story? I don't okay. know it. Okay, so, so we do because you get to go longer because you know that's just the way it okay. goes. The, 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 so we didn't have time for this in the first service. So so after this dinner where four guys kind of shot me down on gender, really. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so the next morning I happened to have breakfast with Patrick in the hotel uh, serve breakfast, and and he was you know we heard that Albert Tate. Uh, talk and, and he was he was wrestling with it and he he was touched and he said to me I've really been thinking about this. I mean imagine you're sitting in a meeting and There's like five or six guys and you're the only woman and I, I about fell out of my chair <laughs> but I, I, and, and, I, <laughs> and then I said back to him <laughs> Imagine you're out to dinner with four guys, and boom, his eyes pop open, and we're just both laughing. But those are, that's, those are like, I totally get that neither Ralph nor Patrick, they have my back, right? They're not intending to shout me down ever, ever. But there's just these little blind spots. Mm -hmm. And so, men, not just in the church, but being the light to the world, this is the redemptive model. There, it's going to set us all free. We, we have to set an example of something that is Christ-like and God-honoring. And, um, you know, we, we get invited to, to, to look at this and to say, you know, the game we've been playing has been marked by a use of power and hierarchy that just isn't supported by the way of Jesus Christ. And I want to end with this picture. Can I have you hold this? I'm not asking you to be subservient. <laughs> Thanks. I did that one-handed last time, and it was really hard. Um, so... What game are we playing when it comes to power and authority in the church? What game are we supposed to be playing? A number of years ago, there was a group of special needs children, and they were brought into a room, and it was going to be a play game, and, and they set up the game of balloon stomp. And um, I think not too long ago, our youth were playing balloon stomp downstairs, and everybody thought that guns were being fired or something, or at least that was a concern. And the idea of the game is, is that there's going to be a hierarchy, and there's going to be the person who wins, and everybody else loses, and it's who can stomp the most balloons. And, and, and they bring the kids in, and they explain the game to them, and, and all of these kids who are special needs, they're, they're struggling... <laughs> And, and none of them are stomping any balloons. They're trying to, and the balloons are flying all around. And then the people watching the game see something amazing. The kids didn't understand the rule. They just thought they were supposed to stomp all the balloons. They start getting down on their knees one at a time, and they hold the balloon for somebody else to stomp. Everybody won. Everybody held a balloon. Everybody stomped a balloon. Everybody won. We're being invited into a different way of understanding power. Where it's not about somebody over somebody else, but it's really about how can we get down on our knees to serve one another, to help lift one another up. We're going to put the cross of Christ over this gender issue when we live into this vision of power. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for the vision and for the way of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you that you were a man out of time who treated women not according to the culture of your day, but according to God's way. Empower all of us to live into this dream of men and women, women and men, all of us together living into this community where we shine forth your glory together. In Jesus' name, amen.